Dámy a pánové, dobrý den. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you at the panel, which will be dedicated to Russia and those processes which have been there for the past two years and the role played by the media in these processes. It's my great pleasure to welcome here distinguished guests from different countries. So let me start on my left hand side. Probably you all know Yefim Fishtein, experienced journalist, former head of the Russian broadcasting of the Radio Liberty from Moscow. We have Evgeny Morozov, the editor-in-chief of the intellectual magazine Russian Life. On my right-hand side, I have well-known Nikolai Rabchuk from Kiev, who will be able to give us the comparison of the situation in Russia and Ukraine. And last but not least, Rostislav Vahovoda, head of East European Programs, Center for Human Rights. And he is one of founders and initiators of Forum European Union and Russia, which is trying to carry out the dialogue between Russia and the European Union at the level of the civil society. And let me start with Yefim Fishtein, who has prepared the keynote speech for the framework of our discussion. The head and the floor is yours. Because uh, actually I'm alone out of the original composition of this panel, so I was asked by the organizers to prepare my paper in, in Czech uh, to make the discussion most, uh, more colorful. But as said, the other speakers changed, so uh, I will speak Czech. But uh, feel free to put your questions in any of the working languages, uh, <coughs> because uh, Andre uh, actually has forgotten to mention that I'm not only uh, Russian, but as well the Czech journalist and American. Ze všeho, co tady bylo v posledních dvou dnech řečeno, je jasné, že sdělovat from all that's been said here, it's clear that media, mass media, are the institution of the civil society, even if there is certain overlap with commercial structure interests. We speak about the role of media in democratic society. So we need to be reminded that democracy is a process, not a situation. It's not something you can put or place into the corner and you look at that with pleasure. And to improve democratic situation, well, mass media could contribute to that. And they could precisely reflect current situation. That's what they are doing in Russia. Mass media assist in developing of democratic society, and they could also reflect the fact that there is no development or there is a backward movement. I think that the boundaries of media in society are reflected in two situations. Number one, Lenin's definition. Newspaper is a collective propaganda maker and collective maker. When he said newspaper here, what he meant was mass media. The second attitude was confirmed by Abraham Lincoln by a well-known sentence. If the people knows facts, there will be peace and quiet in the country. 
He thought that society cannot make a decision without objective information and for exchange of information. Lincoln's sentence might seem naive in the light of new technologies, but the American system as a whole is anchored in that. And he also, uh, also Thomas Jefferson believed that he is free to express his opinion. In Lenin countries, well, people could only laugh. He said, if I should choose between the government without newspaper or newspaper without government, I would opt for the second, for the later. Self-government governance is always more important than state government. The centralized government is necessary only if it's controlled by people and people need to know what the government is actually dealing with so that they could intervene during the elections. That's why the American government has next to no participation at the information business because the foreign broadcast and other media have no access to American territory. Radio and mass media, albeit financed from the state budget, have a system protecting them from the political intervention. That's why in the American institution you cannot find a single word about the mass media being responsible or accountable to anyone. This requirement is directed only to the government under conditions of democracy. Only the people could decide about the existence of its media, where the truth is sought. Then it stops being the momentum for mass media. And that's actually the case of Russian mass media. Until today, they are dealing with discussion with Western civilization in all its facets. Officially, Russian journalists love to claim that their situation reflects their free choice, and they are feeling disdainful towards their foreign colleagues because they are grappling for the freedom. A couple of days ago, the chief of the Russian TV channel, Russia Today, many of you know that, the channel was broadcasting in English and Mrs. Margaret Simonyanova wrote, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for my colleagues from mass media from Western that they are not able to write the truth as if they were not independent mass media. They are providing information support to special operations of NATO. And I'm most sorry for us ourselves. We are such a good souls. They are beating us and we suffer quietly. This discussion is something which appears in Russian history. This discussion with Western countries about mass media and the state propaganda. And it's subjected position is presented as something which liberates people. It's paradoxical that a, an expert who's in charge of a TV channel, which has been established only with the sole purpose of creating propaganda, is sharing these views. These are no news. What's different in Russian mass media are comments. But today, the Russian and foreign broadcasting newsreel is no longer different because domestic channels never count upon the possibility that their newsreel will be compared to that from other resources. Today, specific of Russian information environment is dedicated by electronic 
to electronic media and it's dominated by electronic media. That's why it's a center of attention of powers to be. The Kremlin is still tolerating low number of independent portals and dailies. There are only a few of them from mass media and printed media. Only a couple of dailies are still independent and there are one or two. From among radios, there is one radio with blanket broadcasting and all blanket TV channels through oligarchs close to the powers to be are controlled by the state. And this is how uh, the reflection of the world is directed from above. The popularity of the TV broadcast is explained by the illusion of free of charge access to information. And what's more, TV, which is called in Czech and Russian languages the picture box, is providing a synchronization with latest media compared to printed media because distribution of printed media, especially in the rural countries, is irregular. Russian TV actually is not bringing a real picture. It's building a reality. It forces the viewers to believe that what's on TV is real, what's not there, it wouldn't exist. Here, there is most repulsive element of bureaucracy when the mass media are offering prefab solutions without striving for intellectual activities and thus functioning as a parasite. Electronic media are the best proliferating agents of ideas and viewers and population as getting further apart from democracy. Viewers believe in their state and have state-owned mass media and that's the other part of the life of the society because the involvement in social reality is very low and the TV replaces political life by passively absorbing offered news. And also it replaces other manifestations of political solidarity because viewers are witnessing made-up lives and that creates virtual reality which allures them by its seeming closeness and it creates the illusion of reality. Um, there are fabulations which foster social rights and the feeling of coherence and belonging together. Lately, when we speak about the fear of powers, the Russian government made yet another step on the road of systemic abuse of mass media. Now, media are, according to the Lenin, no longer only a means of propaganda. The government is forcing them to adopt a role of provider impulses for litigations. Quite recently, a couple of days back or a week ago, the state prosecutor started a litigation against a group of leftists from the opposition headed by Segrek Udaltsev based on the film documentary called The Anatomy of the Protest part two, which was direct, uh, made and shown by LDA TV, and uh, the TV means independent TV. And there 
were found guilty of provoking m mass protests and civil unrest. They are trying to prove that the opposition is funded from abroad, and they were used. Uh, they were using shots made by a hidden camera, showing the meeting of the accused leaders of the opposition from a member of the parliament from the Georgia, and allegedly they were organizing protests. I say allegedly because there is no sound, there is just a buzz in the background, and the dialogues were decoded in a form of subtitles and head headings, and it's impossible to do the lip reading, neither to verify the precision of those captions. The hidden camera was used for the purpose of the litigation and the secret recording, if it was taken by Georgian or other secret services, would serve as the evidence of the guilt of the accused. So there is the operation of the Federal Security Service. In another word, the Department for Fight with Domestic Opposition and the TV channel is showing these materials so that it would serve as the evidence against the accused parties. The Secret Service formally adopted other measures of trying to find a material to compromise third parties through AG Provocateur women who served as a counterpart for <laughs> false evidence, and that was shown on the YouTube. But still, private life cannot be prosecuted, not yet, but in this case, it gave the ground for the litigation. And Russian press, instead of providing some kind of feedback, has become a direct component of the government power, especially of the so-called power departments, power ministries. Um, I would like to point out that the monitoring of the opposition in America was paid for by Nixon, who was impeached. In uh, Russia, it's a different case. But the prosecutor's office used this material for litigation purposes and to dampen opposition activity. Once the participants of the protests in the end of last year, beginning of this year, were intimidated or taken to court, uh, uh, what, what followed was the cleaning up of the space, in this case, media uh, space, using various kinds of judicial restrictions. Um, uh, one case was uh, badly translated in, in, into uh, Czech when, when the media uh, wrote uh, about the measures taken against opposition organizations. Um, uh, the info, uh, information uh, in, in, in Russia, foreign donor organizations active uh, in Russia had to register as foreign agents. Uh, um, there was some kind of mistranslation into Czech where the word agent can mean uh, something uh, more amicable than, than, than the sense as we understand it in Russian or in English. This applied to uh, social 
organizations, non-commercial organizations. It applies also to the media. Many internet portals in Russia, for instance, have foreign sponsors, so these had to register as agents too. The media uh, image of Russian reality is more important than the reality proper. Um, uh, now, the media can be controlled, and that means that the reality can be controlled also. This is nothing new in Russian history, although it was called Soviet history then. In those days, however, such uh, infringement of what was called socialist uh, law had ideological reasons. Today, the press is used in a very cynical manner. Nobody takes into account things like credibility or truthfulness. Simply, what is thought, what they think is as long as it's strong, it doesn't need the trust of citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe I could uh, follow up uh, on what you said about the document and, and protest too. I have to admit that I didn't see it to the end. Uh, sort of mentally, I couldn't stand it. When Alexander Mamontov, uh, a well-known war correspondent, one of the greatest stars of NTV, uh, besides uh, showing all these secret camera uh, shots, also started saying that uh, the British artist Bengtsson, who supported Pussy Riot or, or Voina, uh, in fact does not exist. And he uh, documented this by saying that he traveled to London, was looking for that man for two days, couldn't find him. And according to this was proof that this is a kind of group of people who are trying uh, to um, fight against Russia ideologically. And we get quite a lot of news like that from Russia. Yesterday, for instance, I heard that uh, the Petrograd, Petersburg uh, Philharmonic Orchestra, uh, which plays Rachmaninoff's piano concert, uh, 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 banned under 16-year-olds uh, from attending this concert. Another news, uh, uh, Skolkov, which is a kind of Russian Silicon Valley, will organize a conference where a lot of various Nobel laureates were invited as well as other experts. And the main lecture is titled From Perpetuum Medulla and Sci-Fi to the Innovation of the Century. And I could continue reading the list. In Petersburg, for instance, Madonna is uh, being on trial for promoting homosexualism. From a Prague point of view, a Western point of view, it doesn't give much sense. So uh, these are absurdities uh, from our point of view. What do they mean? And I would like to ask Evgeny Morozov uh, what he thinks about that. Thank you. I will speak in Russian. Yes, the situation in Russia is, uh, uh, is a paradox, really. And this is even more marked uh, since uh, the time when Putin decided to run for his third term as president. What is this paradox about? Well, in the past, uh, uh, there was no such debate in society. There was no direct discussion of these matters, uh, 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 especially in the circles independent of the government, not in the way as uh, the discussions run uh, this last year. We heard about Pussy Riot. Uh, this was uh, news which uh, was spread in the whole world. We heard about other types of protests. We also heard about what is happening in the left-wing movement. 
and other fields. And the press, too, both federal and internet uh, sources, which are not so much dependent on uh, various subsidies, uh, do engage in critical debate. But in parallel, repressions increase. And all of us understand that this is not by chance. Uh, we know that things will not return to what we had in the past, but what we see is the reflection of the line followed by the Putin government, which is trying to liquidate the opposition. There is no dialogue with the opposition. There is no attempt to engage in a dialogue with the opposition. Everybody is aware of that, and that is why media and the press especially, consider this to be a paradox, which is a part of our lives. Recently, I wrote that this is no longer only a matter of politics. It's fate, because free expression of um, any uh, journalist leads to a conflict with those in power and may result in persecution and uh, a banning of such uh, journalists uh, from their profession. Uh, how will all this end? Very few know. Some people compare the situation with the period of the Brezhnev government. They say there is a certain analogy here. They say that this uh, system, Putin's system, will disintegrate the same as uh, the Brezhnev system did. Others, sociologists, say that this is a completely new phenomenon, and we cannot compare what is happening with uh, authoritarian regimes like that of Franco before the war or with the post-war soft uh, authoritarian models. They say this is a completely new phenomenon which is uh, linked to the mediocracy, as Yefim said, and also with a profound uh, change in representative democracy and uh, manipulation of the society. I think it is uh, not possible to say, to give a simple answer as to how this situation will end. On one hand, we have a certain freedom of speech for the educated uh, strata, and the 100,000 mentioned by, the, by Sabrikin, a Moscow journalist recently, these are the people who took part in the protests or demonstrations of people who read opposition news, these people as a social group will, will not uh, disappear. They are expressing a certain view. But the corporation, Russia, the Russia corporation, will also not disappear. It is standing firmly on its legs. This is the Putin. Uh, uh, machine uh, which, uh, leaning on its real, real politic, will continue to stand firmly on its legs for a long time to come, destroying the idea of political competition and political reforms and freedom of expression. And uh, one other thing I would like to mention, we hear a lot about how the new media, social media, are important in the process of uh, democratization. I think that we all hoped that the media will have a greater positive impact than they um, actually have as they are reflected in the results achieved by the opposition in the last year. 
uh, especially opposition against the third uh, presidential term of Putin. In 1998, we had only 500,000 internet users. And only 50,000 of them, 50,000 of them used the internet daily. But since the 1990s, we have 40 to 50 million active users of the internet. Nonetheless, we know that of the 40 million, only seven, five to seven percent are interested in social and political events. That. Uh, 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 I, as an active political observer and uh, reporter, see who reads our texts. I don't know what the situation is in, in the Czech um, uh, Republic, but uh, uh, the maximum number of people who read an important text will be 100,000. Uh, people like Lech Kashin or Yuri Saprikin, uh, who write about uh, social and political issues, uh, might have about 30,000 readers. And 30,000, that's an important number. In Moscow, they say that who supports political reforms uh, in a rational way, who has made a rational choice, those are the people with whom you can uh, speak or we can meet at uh, book uh, fairs, for instance. Uh, those are the 30,000 people who go to events like that. Uh, to conclude, uh, I would like to say something a little bit more positive. The events of the last year and the whole sense of, of the protests and their reflection in the media is uh, proof of, if we compare, for instance, the American and the French Revolution, in our country, we do not speak about a social uh, revolution, but we speak about a revolution of dignity. Whoever protests against the third term of uh, Putin is protesting not against social injustice, but uh, protesting against uh, a uh, uh, the destruction of of uh, human dignity, uh, and this is reflected by opposition media, which were described so well by F. F. Fischstein media, who which find it m more and more difficult to remain in the public space. Every day we get news that the government and uh, the power that be exerts pressure on internet providers, journalists, political activists who write for these media. And it seems that this pressure will continue and uh, this paradox will continue for at least another year, year and a half. Uh, I would now uh, like to address uh, Mikhail Rabchuk. Of course, all these comparisons sometimes uh, are a little bit misguiding. In the Ukraine, uh, we often hear that after the return of Viktor uh, Yanukovych uh, to power, the media uh, situation worsened. So the question is, can we make such comparisons? To what degree are they relevant? What is the Ukrainian experience with the free media? Similarities because uh, this country spent uh, together uh, like uh, 200 years, and uh, they also share some uh, legacy of Eastern Christianity, of Byzantium, 
but at the same time, of course, there are profound differences. Uh, I remember a very, uh, very nice uh, comparison uh, of three uh, political regimes in Ukraine, polit uh, Belarus, and, uh, and Russia, provided 15 years ago by late uh, Dmitry Furman, a prominent Russian scholar and intellectual. He uh, tried to uh, foresee, uh, forecast uh, eventual developments of uh, political regimes in all these countries, and um, he was very revealing, actually, in, in his predictions. Uh, he tried to conceptualize uh, these developments um, as uh, attempts of uh, local, uh, of post-communist elites to modernize their countries, because it was the main challenge for all the post-Soviet, all post-communist states, a uh, challenge of modernization. And uh, he uh, uh, presented Russian story as uh, uh, fighting between uh, advanced uh, modernizing capital city and a very uh, conservative, reactionary, uh, Sovietophile uh, province. And this uh, fighting ended up with a uh, kind of coup d'etat and uh, Yeltsin's imposition uh, of authoritarian rule uh, and attempt of modernization uh, under authoritarian flag. Mm, this is actually what, what was continued and is continued by, by Putin. Uh, Belarusian story was the opposite. He argued that uh, in Belarus, uh, the capital city, modernizing capital city, modernizing elites, um, had been traditionally weak. And, and because of this, they were defeated by the conservative Sovietophile province. And Lukashenko embodies this, uh, this force. Uh, so uh, Sovietophile forces got revenge in Belarus, and we still have, still have this uh, neo-Soviet uh, kind of, of regime. Uh, Ukrainian story is the most complicated, because in Ukraine also we have the same, uh, according to Furman, we have also uh, modernizing advanced uh, capital with, uh, with modern uh, Western thinking elites. Uh, but, uh, and also we have very conservative uh, Sovietophile province. But Ukraine province is divided. We have uh, really very conservative, even reactionary province in the southeast. But, but we have also uh, more pro-Western and advanced province in the west, which is natural ally of the capital city. So uh, Furman argued that Ukraine has a sort of two locomotives which may uh, pull uh, this uh, huge uh, train uh, and very clumsy train uh, forward. So in a way he was right because so far Ukraine of course uh, looks more advanced than uh, either Russia uh, or, or Belarus but still uh, Ukraine shares the same problem of uh, political culture of the same legacy. I believe that all these countries have uh, the main problem with identity. Because because in all these uh, within in all these nations, uh, modern identity actually has not been formed. Uh, the, the process of nation building in all these countries was derailed as early as in uh, in the 17th, early 18th century, uh, by uh, actually by by Russian uh, myth about Kiev and Rus, about this uh, fantastic story of of. Uh, continuity of uh, Kiev legacy, and, uh, and the worst thing was that uh, this orthodox Christian identity was etatized. Uh, and uh, vice versa, uh, uh, statist, imperial identity was sacralized because of this fusion. And this fusion was very dangerous, and this fusion still works. This fusion still uh, creates and supports a mythical uh, idea of Ruski Mir, which is megalomanic and messianic, and which detracts uh, attention of Russian population, of Russian elites from uh, real problems to some uh, absolutely fantastic projects like competing with America and, and so on. And so on. Moreover, this this identity uh, 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 is very helpful for ruling elites to manipulate uh, people because uh, it's very easy to to inflame uh, chauvinistic uh, uh, feelings, and also this identity um, uh, legitimizes such a regime, uh, at least uh, among a substantial part of the population. So uh, my uh, major argument is that uh, as long as Russia fails to reconcile fundamentally reconsider, fundamentally revise its, 
its uh, pre-modern identity, it would fail to modernize the country, it would fail to, to democratize the country. The same problem, of course, is, uh, exists in Ukraine and in Russia, but I believe that Ukraine is more advanced in this reg uh, in Belarus as well. Ukraine is more advanced in, in this regard, but still it's, uh, it's a big problem, a big challenge. I emphasize once again that any identity uh, has uh, axiological dimension. Any identity is attached to some values. And the identity, this uh, Ruski Mir uh, identity is basically anti-modern. It was uh, based, it was founded on fundamentally anti-Western, anti-modern values. So uh, it's very important to, to, to revise and to reconsider. And it's a big challenge. So I, so far I don't know, I don't see actually in Russia uh, any political force which is uh, ready to uh, to challenge this myth. Uh, so there is no Yezhi Gedroys is Russia in Russia, unfortunately, so far. Well, thank you. And our last guest. I knew that you were founding the Russian European Forum at the time of the Medvedev presidency, when it still looked like that Russia would actually try to follow the path of modernization, democratization, and now Putin's back. So how that was reflected in your work, in your activity at the forum? Well, that's a good question. Excellent question, because really the atmosphere was reflected in our activities. First, because the policy in relation with non-profit organizations has changed. The new law was adopted according to which all non-profit organizations have to be registered as a foreign agent or they are exposed to the risk of the litigation. But during adoption of this law, the new policy were shaping up. The new policy of the current Russian state, it was division and rule. The Russian state will try at this moment to divide non-for-profit organizations for human rights, ecologic, environmental, those criticizing less, those criticizing more. And the state will try to say, these non-for-profit organizations are the right ones, the constructive ones, those which cooperate, and those are those we don't like, so we won't speak to them. And this is the conflict which have been created within the environment where the situation is getting more and more serious. People are beginning to think how to behave. Do we register ourselves as a foreign agent or not? This is a crucial decision for organizations, and this risk creates a pressure. And that's reflected in our activities at the forum, because there is an obvious difference in the attitude of normal non-for-profit organizations and those protecting human rights. In my opinion, this conflict will get deeper and deeper. And as Russian secret services proved, there will be a pressure for new conflict in the environment of non-for-profit organizations because the Russian government perceives them as a potential risk. And I believe that what will follow and um, I think that will follow the situation in Azerbaijan, that the Russian state will subsidy some of these non-for-profit organizations following the logic that there should be a friction created and conflict within the whole sector. And if that happens, really, the situation will become serious. And at this moment, I'd like to say that, in general, the response of the Russian regime to unheard of f 
flare of involvement of Russian public will lead sooner or later to conflict. And perhaps my opinion is controversial, but I don't think that this will survive in this regime. In the horizon of 10, 15 years, the current regime, as it's based in the middle class, well, I think that today's regime had lost the middle class. In the situation when 100 people is uh, in the streets, these people have much stronger support. These are not the people who would mind that news or journalists are being shot. These are people who are simply tired of seeing the same faces every day, tired of the attitude of the Russian state towards them. And it influences the life of everyone. If you're an entrepreneur, if you want to do the business in Russia, in any moment, the secret agent can come to you saying, well, I want my share or you will lose your company. So if you are doing business with this perspective, well, I think that the Soviet regime, uh, sorry, a Russian regime had lost the middle class. And the question is where these people would turn to, because if there is a lesson from the Arab Spring, and we were talking a lot about that, what Europe or the Western countries, what lesson should be taken from the Arab Spring, from those revolutions in Egypt or Tunisia. People were coming and were surprised that people are not welcoming them as saviors. They were not welcoming them because the Egyptian army was using American weapons against them or that the armed forces were supported by Western countries, and people felt deceived. And I think the same goes in Russia, in Russia today. In Russia, it's clear that this elite, which still exists, will not be there in 15 years. And the point is, what elite at this moment we would like to see in the country, what elite we would like to support? And if they feel that Europe and West is not the way to opt for, then it's bad news for Europe. Much worse than we could imagine. And the quality of democracy in this country depends to a certain extent to the regime which rules of Russia. Well, thank you, and after initial set of questions, I will no longer abuse my right to moderate the discussion, so you can ask questions. The front row here. Well, I have a question. I'm going to speak in Russian. My question is, the president of the Chechnya recently had said to journalists that if all of a sudden the internet would disappear, all adults of Navalny and other people would disappear as well. What do you think about that? Well, if this position is, well, the creature of the West. Internet. 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 Well, if Kadyrov had said that, well, he could have said that. If cars would appear, Chechnya would be independent as well. In any case, nothing could disappear. What we heard also is that the technical means as such are not determining 
factor for social development. Naturally, technical means could either help or hinder the development, but they are not determining it. Internet probably exists in Zimbabwe as well. Internet exists all over the world. The second question is, to what extent is Internet accessible, available for the whole world and for Russian people to link them with the world? It seems that some countries are not using Internet but intranet. So perhaps Russia is facing a similar situation that they will have their own Internet. But finally, media are not creating the society. Well, it's the truth that I first met Mr. Morozov as a well-known blogger in 2006-2007. To what extent Internet could play a role? How important it is for mass media people, for journalists? I would like to say that perhaps we should not take everything so seriously. Yesterday, probably, an imp yesterday, an important member of the church said that if we want, we can invite 100,000 people and everything will be destroyed, but we are not doing that. And now Kadyrov had said something, so perhaps we should not pay so much attention to what he said. Perhaps we should try to find a broader picture. Does Putin and his and people close to him have really ideological sources for having the situation under control, or does he lack these sources? And the second question, those who are forming the opposition today, do they have the possibility to get transformed to something like the Charter 77? or? Is it certain political phenomenon which cannot be destroyed, phenomenon which could be developed based on political aspects? Because, you know, the Internet had played an important role in improving the social life. It has all started in 2008. and. At that time, Medvedev was the president, and we were witnessing certain dynamic situation, which were getting livelier. People often ask me whether Russian government would follow the Chinese Path, whether they will create Russian intranet and try to cut off Russia from internet. Well, I tend not to believe that, but, well, actually we are all reading the same newspaper and the latest news do not make us or do not give us the reason to be overly optimistic. I think those conclusions from the Putin activity leads us towards isolation. No one knows where these efforts would end up, because on one hand, Russia, thanks to cultural traditions and thanks to democratic experience or non-experience, could opt for the same path as Iran, Azerbaijan or China, that they cannot get into the same situation. Nevertheless, 
The fear is mounting, but not because of Kadyrov and his threats. Uh, I believe politicians are, in a way, products of mass media. I'm not sure whether Mr. Udalsov uh, wouldn't have uh, existed without uh, internet, but I'm sure, I'm definitely sure, that there would have been no Mr. Putin without TV. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Rostislav. Uh, maybe uh, there is no sense in uh, responding to that uh, uh, statement. The Internet is here, and thank God. But of course, uh, uh, it does bring with it a number of uh, problems. Uh, but I think what has been said also illustrates the type of uh, society uh, to which the current Kremlin is oriented, uh, what type of society it perceives as the source of its legitimacy. And in this sense, there has been a certain change in Russia. Some five, seven years ago, when uh, uh, the prices of oil were enormous. Uh, Russia was receiving billions in petrodollars. And this was a time when journalists and activists were murdered. But Western politicians said, well, yes, of course, we don't like the idea of them shooting people. But um, on the other hand, 70% of people are happy with the situation there. What can we do? And Russia is developing. But the problem is, Oh, let me start again. Uh, the living standards of the middle classes uh, improved, or maybe better uh, said, it was f the middle classes were, were forming in those days. But the prospect of the middle uh, classes today are deteriorating. Russia today is more dependent on oil and gas than when Putin came to power. At the same time, it increases its uh, uh, weapons expenditures and police expenditures, and this is going to deteriorate even further. When the revolution, which uh, uh, came with um, with shell gas and which uh, uh, resulted in reducing the gas prices has affected Russia. And today they say that Gazprom can expect uh, two or three fat years after which a decline will come. Russia is not developing any new uh, oil uh, sources. It will soon have a problem with covering its own domestic uh, demand. The consortium, Stockmann, which was planning new fields in the Arctic, uh, resigned on these uh, uh, plans because the price uh, was not uh, feasible. And, of course, these are enormous uh, problems that uh, Russia will have to face. Uh, the current Russian regime has no idea of how to deal with them. And it thinks it will deal with them by, by taking steps against the active part of the society who is willing to go out into the streets, who travels to the West, who knows that uh, things can be different. It, it sees this uh, group of the society as, 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 as traitors. So this is why I said at the beginning that Russia is on the road to conflict. Uh, uh, five, seven years ago, we heard that Putin means stability. What I say is Putin means instability, and uh, Western politicians should be aware of this when they speak about doing business with Russia. They should understand what they are trying to support in Russia. Uh, I believe that the conflict is inevitable. I believe that it will be bloody. I'm not happy to say so. 
But I think that this conflict might culminate in something much worse than the current regime. The important thing is uh, uh, for us uh, to support people who uh, want a democratic free Russia. Are there any more questions? I am from uh, Belarus. I have a question and a remark. We hear that uh, Russia is uh, preparing or experimenting with a kind of model that would give the impression that everything is proceeding calmly, safely. Uh, we believed in the past uh, that uh, we will be saved by free media independent media, and that, that is a positive thing. But what we see recently is that the free media are manipulative, and uh, the free media are demonized. We look so ugly in the eyes of citizens that they do not consider us to be an alternative. Maybe we overestimated the uh, significance of civil society and free media instead of developing a broader platform and looking for different types of actors uh, who could help to promote democratic changes. And now we find ourselves in this paradox or maybe Kafkaesque uh, situation when our simplified uh, sort of view led to these unexpected results. I would like to uh, comment in a few words. This is a very important uh, remark, important question. All of us uh, think about this, discuss it, even in Russia. But I think uh, that we should draw on the idea of uh, trying to uh, see what portion of blame should be attributed to the opposition media. Why is it that they can't win over more than 100,000 listeners or readers? And the answer is simple. No authoritarian regime which is uh, suppressing the opposition, which has the information space under its control, creates a situation in which the opposition cannot accumulate a critical mass of votes that would create a political opposition. Uh, so uh, maybe we shouldn't speak about the blame of, Russian, of the Russian opposition or today's Russian opposition. That, uh, or blaming them uh, for not being able to sell themselves to the Russian citizens. This is a thesis which is uh, often used by the political representatives of uh, power. They say, Alexander Navalny, you don't have anybody listening to you. You don't have this large mass of listeners. There is no large group supporting you. So we are right, not you. But it is evident that this is not a fair playing field. Uh, it is not possible to win in such a situation, and uh, we will never uh, succeed to overcome an authoritarian regime in this way. Uh, one sentence, uh, when they ask me during a TV interview, they say, well, Putin is popular. You can't deny that. Look at uh, the rating, 75% popularity. Well, I answer, well, uh, we can hear about how popular dictators are only after their, their death or uh, before that uh, to speak about their popularity is ridiculous. Saddam Hussein was extremely popular. Where are the people who voted for him, who claimed that he was their idol? Where are they today? Maybe just a few. So. There are 
certain specific conditions created for the popularity of the leader in power. And these uh, circumstances, these conditions are artificial. Once uh, he, his, his regime is uh, overturned, uh, the decision will be different. Look at the leader of um, uh, Uzbekistan. He had a golden statue. He had months of the year named after him. And when he died, suddenly the golden statue was pushed into the mud and the calendar was abolished. Was he popular? What does the word popularity mean in such regimes? Is it an expression of love, of free will, or does it reflect the specific uh, conditions which lie over the country as a glass bell? Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Magda Shebestova, uh, I would like to follow up on what has been said about popularity. Two days now we have been discussing whether people have access to media, whether the media are of a good quality, whether they distort uh, reality, whether they manipulate people. All these things are true, sometimes more, sometimes less. But I think that we have also agreed, and not only on this panel, but also other panels, that today, thanks to the modern technologies, there is access to the media everywhere in the world today. But the question is whether everybody have the ability, the, the internet literacy, whether they are not too lazy to choose to select what is relevant, what is sophisticated. Maybe we should also speak about what kind of an audience we are, what kind of readers we are, what kind of listeners we are, and to focus more on the quality of the recipient. Because if the, the viewer, the reader, were more sophisticated, if the viewer would demand a better quality of information, if the viewer would be able to find the information, then such a viewer could also influence the media that would have to adapt to the high quality of viewer or reader. Thank you. That's an interesting point. Um, both here and universally, a uh, discussion is going on how to transform uh, media to attract the potential audience. Uh, because uh, in the 10 million people living in Moscow, there are 100,000 uh, people who used to go to these demonstrations who might be interested. But the opposition as such, and also the liberally thinking uh, journalists, uh, have a difficulty uh, with uh, how to present the information, especially to a young audience. Uh, uh, now, for instance, uh, uh, Radio Free Europe has stopped its broadcast to Russia, will stop its broadcast to Russia, and is preparing a new project based on the internet. Is this an attempt to win over a new audience? Or, or what is the intention of RFE in this regard? Well, if you're asking me personally, I did not participate in this project, do not participate, so I can't say where it will lead. I have no idea. Um, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, that it will not be broadcast on FM, uh, well, uh, that's what the law requires. Uh, uh, the law itself, for somebody who needs uh, specific evidence of where the regime is aiming, well, this law is um, proof. It's, it's uh, a good example of how uh, Kremlin is uh, behaving. It, uh, banned the activities of foreign broadcasters on the territory of Russia who do not have a Russian co-owner. 51% ownership has to be in the hands of a Russian partner. In other words, the Russian co-owner must be a majority owner. So for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, this uh, is unfeasible. 
um, according to its foundation, founding charter, it is financed by the Congress of the United States, and it must not have a different uh, co-owner, with, which with 51 percent ownership can influence um, uh, the policy of, of the station and so on. So this kind of policy liquidates any possibility to uh, uh, to provide foreign broadcasting in Russia. And then, of course, there are other global reasons and so on. Anything that is broadcast uh, uh, from Russia cannot have a foreign co-owner. But I would like to ask Alexander uh, Morozov, uh, how do Russian journalists uh, uh, win uh, uh, their audiences? How do they manage to adapt to the changing demands of their audiences, their readers? This is a very difficult question. And it, it's a question which we heard here earlier. Uh, this is a question which is being discussed everywhere, all over the world. We all know that the social mission of uh, TV and, and the media is in crisis all over the world. Uh, under Berlusconi in Italy, this has been a, a frequent theme because the media were politically corrupted, corrupted from the political point of view. Sometimes I feel like uh, saying that we journalists could do more, but uh, also, uh, there is another aspect. If the political system and social consensus presumes that uh, the TV and other media should uh, uh, represent or reflect different social groups which uh, have their individual functions in society, have their own tasks, and all of them aim for social welfare. If these groups are critical, then nobody will suspect them of going against the government. And this is where the journalist can fulfill his or her mission. The media can fulfill uh, their mission because they are a component of the whole mechanism of democracy and assurance of freedoms. Uh, nevertheless, if a mechanism is anchored in the media, a mechanism which interprets uh, the efforts of social groups as something anti-state, anti-government, then nothing can be done. When you have an emerging system where you have uh, first uh, tools, instruments uh, for, for social uh, evaluation and so on. For instance, somebody doesn't like an exhibition of modern art and, and uh, there is some kind of moral uh, denunciation, suddenly a group of MPs uh, submit uh, a law according to which organizers of such uh, uh, exhibitions should be persecuted. And this, of course, will affect all the activities also of the non-commercial uh, center, but also of industrial associations, uh, uh, chambers, art societies. And, in, and this is a situation which we cannot compare with the kind of crisis uh, which we encounter in Western media when they search for their social role. Yes, also the BBC is searching for its role, for its position, uh, but our situation is much more difficult. Uh, it's similar like uh, in the opposition, the journalist on their own cannot overcome a system in which so many restrictions are anchored. They can either die heroically like Poetkovskaya or they can emigrate or they can arrive at a compromise. And uh, then we get into this terrible situation when we merely wait and wait 
and uh, when we play certain roles, somebody will be a dissident with or without support uh, of uh, the society, and it doesn't lead anywhere and until something that we have not under control occurs. Perhaps I would agree that there is a different situation in Russia and it depends on users what they would do. So the situation is simply different even in a normal democracy is the responsibility for the media quality lays with those who are managing it primarily and only secondarily it depends on the audience but in russia what's traditionally perceived as a source of hope like new media well people keep talking about that and here the state is rather active and sophisticated in coming up with tools for mastering this sphere. It's not only that so-called brigade, it means people who are paid for writing on purpose and fulfilling different forums, but FSB recently had published a tender, actually two tenders to develop a new software. This software should automatically Number one, analyze mood at the social network and the second tender. The software should be able to generate required content on different forums. It means that this rather costly process should be automated because you cannot have your people at all forums. So it would be done automatically. So even this sphere, which traditionally is perceived as the sphere of the least possible intervention from the part of the state, well, it would really depend on the powers to be. And as I said, Europe, in my opinion, based on my discussions with diplomats, Europe has a role to play because we need to be able to respond to the new development in Russia. Should we say that we should close down non-for-profit organizations because they are talking with us or because they were not registered as a foreign agent because based on the new law they could be prosecuted for high treason? And is it really worth adopting laws like this? because we have a strategic partnership with Russia and we do not want to threaten that. So if Europe has got something to lose is that strategic partnership with Russian citizens, because there are citizens in Russia and sooner or later they will be holding the power. And as I say, it's up to us. What are the people who will come after Putin because the history around Putin is coming to the end. Well, we are coming to the end as well, but we have time for one or two questions. English. Uh, my question is, there are 110, 140, the population of Russia is 140 million people. The number of Russian voters is 110 million people. The number of internet users now is estimated at about 50 million people. Now, my question is, why, under these absolutely free conditions in Russia now, elections at the, uh, at the elections to the so-called uh, opposition committee, only 80,000 people of the advanced 50 million internet users took part? Yeah, yeah I am doplním pro ty, kteří nesledují příliš dění v Rusku. For those who are not 
for those who are not acquainted with the situation in Russia, there were elections to the Coordination Committee. This is something the opposition came up with, with the aim of finding out who has got what support. It's been running on for several days, and during that time, servers were inaccessible due to hackers' attacks. But the question remains, 80,000 people took part. Is it enough or not? It seems enough. In the election system of one person, one vote, well, we all know that the tougher the regime is, may it be quasi authoritarian or totally authoritarian, the less space for expressing free will. In Cuba, we have, say, 1,000 of dissidents. What does it mean? If you open the borders, 100,000 people would run away. Is it too many or not? In Russia, for 10 million people in Moscow, demonstrations with 100, 120,000 people is not that few, because voting needs certain activity. And those who are voting via internet, no one is taking them by bus and no one is paying them for their vote. And these are people who are expressing their will in spite of the fact that there is a certain danger. There is yet another question. Does it serve any purpose or not? The opposition must express itself, not to lose self-respect when they are oppressed by the power. So for me, it's rational that the part of the population need to be able to learn how to do free voting. So for me, it's enough, even those protests. The head count for enough for me, because I was trying to find out how the pyramid of power was falling apart, and it was. I know people who were creating the ideological background of Kremlin, those people who were trying to create new Russian ideology for Putin, because regime is based on ideas, and new Russia needed, badly needed, any consistent ideology which would encompass both past and the present, and which would come up with vision for the future. The problem is that it's not easy in Russia to find this three elements of self-government and freedom. This is unperceivable for Russia. Russia cannot base its existence on a single column. What has happened around January last year? All of a sudden, the ideological background of Kremlin fell apart, and those people surrounding Gleb Pavlovsky and others those who were really creating new ideology fell down and fell out from the grace and the power. And for me, it represented great uncertainty in those corridors of power, so to say. And some of those worldly elites disappeared, like show business celebrities as such. They started to disappear, and that's the indicator of falling apart. So, based on your original question, I think it's enough people. Alexander Morozov. Well, in lieu of the answer, I'll give you one phrase, thanks to which I'm optimistic. Because regardless of all critique aspects of this discussion, I'd love to hear something positive. We were 
witnessing a historic event in Russia when tens of thousands of young people who in the years 2008 till 2010 took part in different civil initiatives, not political initiatives, civil initiatives, and they were resolving public questions or protection of historical monuments, or they were trying to stimulate creating bike paths in their areas. So these new organizations, these young people were those who responded when the power had said, well, if you don't believe that they were just and open election, you can become a member of committees, you can be observers. These people went there and that had started the process because it only proves how dynamic could be the transformation, transformation from social to political. Those who became observers got a major, so to say, slap in the face because the whole system after the election responded by sheer silence to any criticism. Nevertheless, the fact itself gives us at least an element of hope, and that's my answer to your question, if it, how many people you need to have the critical mass for bringing that change. Number. I mean, 80,000 people voluntarily voting in an internet uh, ballot. That's that's fantastic number. Which other political party in this country, for instance, take the Scottish as an example, would get this number in the internet vote? Uh, so, as, as as was mentioned here, uh, the, the the and uh, one one more thing to to add. Charter 77. I don't remember the time myself. It's just what I know from history books. But was signed by a few hundreds of people at the very beginning. For the most of the communism, it was either ignored, not known, or hated by the, by the majority. It's just that not always the majority counts. It's more, it's more about the, the, the ideals. It's more about the ideas that people represent. And there are people in, in Russian civil society today that do represent better, more democratic, open Russia than the current regime. And as I said uh, already before, I think that, that it is now up to the West to support these people. Not, don't let these people down, because if you will, there will be Russia that is worse than it is today. Well, thank you, and um, I believe that will wrap up this panel. So I'd like to thank all panel members, and I'd like to invite Jakub Klepal from Forum 2000. Uh, I am here just to do one thing, which is to uh, thank you and invite uh, uh, His Excellency, uh, former Foreign Minister of Australia, Mr. Gareth Evans, to present a brief summary of the conference. Uh, Gareth Evans. Thank you, Jakob, ladies and gentlemen. If anyone had any doubt that Forum 2000 could survive the passing in this last year of Václav Havel and Alda Czerny, those doubts have been comprehensively put at rest over the last two days. First of all, quantitatively, the figures have just been spectacular. 150 delegates from all over the world, 2,500 registered participants, more than 50 events 
in 13 separate locations around Prague and three outside Prague. And the attendance just yesterday on the first day of the conference, surpassing the entire attendance for the whole period of the conference last year. This has been a formidable organizational achievement on the part of Jakub Klepo and his team, his team of something over 150 staff, but particularly volunteers, and they deserve our gratitude and our admiration. But I guess it's the qualitative contribution that will linger in the memory of the participants at this conference. The different sessions gave us an absolute feast of different themes on which to intellectually feed. Diplomacy, ethics, economics, poverty and development, the environment, human rights, democracy, and of course, the role of the media. And all of them contextualized in a kaleidoscope of different geographic settings. Burma, Tibet, Hungary, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, the Balkans, China and Taiwan, Middle East, the Nile Basin in Africa, Venezuela. The main theme of the conference, of course, was media and democracy. And a number of critical issues were very exhaustively debated over the last two days. Three big issues in particular dominated our discussions. The first was the future of traditional media industry as we've known it. It was acknowledged, as one participant said, that there's been an absolutely tectonic shift occurring, certainly fundamentally threatening very long established business models. I don't think any of us emerged with a very clear idea of what future business models are going to look like, but it was very clear that there was a hunger among everyone here for the media to survive in at least some form that can guarantee a source of information to the public and to act as an absolutely critical ingredient in democratic decision-making and accountability. The second theme that, or second set of issues that we debated were challenges to free and responsible media, which were seen as coming from both free and unfree societies. In the context of free societies, the challenge came from the imperative of commercialization, the dumbing down that we've all become so familiar with, the economic pressures resulting in the closure of huge numbers of newspapers, dramatic reduction in the competition of ideas through traditional media outlets, the Murdoch monopoly syndrome, which I'm very familiar with in an Australian context, city after city having simply one media proprietor, print media proprietor operating. In unfree societies, of course, the challenge was seen and argued out over and over again to come from authoritarian censorship, the heavy-handed treatment of the media that we've debated in panel after panel after panel. The third issue about the media and democracy that we discussed was, of course, the role of new media. And obviously, this offers tremendous hope of compensating for the challenges that I've just mentioned in free societies by opening up multiple new channels of communication to compensate for those that are closing off or narrowing down. I think there's one very interesting exchange at one point in one of the panels which very starkly revealed the different perspectives that are out there in this respect. At one point, um, former president of Romania, Emil Constantinescu, said, the media still failed to play their role. If asked what they know about Romania, the Czechs are not going to be able to say very much. But 
he was immediately responded to by another panelist, the Czech economist Tomáš Sedláček, who said, well, I might not know much, but in five minutes, thanks to the internet, I'll be able to tell you things about Romania that maybe you don't even know about. And I think that capsulated exactly the kind of potential contribution the new media is playing in terms of free societies. But what about in unfree societies? The channels for bypassing authoritarian restrictions are now super abundantly obvious, the potential of those channels, provided, of course, that they can somehow stay ahead of the censors. And if they can stay ahead of the censors, these new channels will create an atmosphere of really vibrant exchange of ideas and information. But with the qualification that was noted so often in our proceedings, that really authoritarian societies can themselves use these channels for even more comprehensive and sophisticated surveillance. So it's by no means a one-way process. In terms of the relationship between media and democracy, one of the recurring themes of this meeting that I found really important was the recognition that the difference between free and unfree societies is not always really as stark as we tend to assume when we're making these distinctions. The term illiberal democracy, illiberal democracy, was one used in multiple panels, particularly to describe the situations in Hungary and Ukraine, but also a number of other countries as well. And it's really important that we appreciate, we recognize how fragile some of our democratic and human rights achievements actually remain, and how important it is that the ongoing tasks, not only of achieving these rights in the first instance, but of consolidating them and maintaining them, be effectively carried through. And of course, it's in this respect that the legacy of Václav Havel and the Forum 2000 that he created 16 years ago with Elie Wiesel and Yohai Sasakawa remains so absolutely critically important. If you're looking for the bottom line value added of this forum, I think you can find it in abundance of the testimony that we heard through so many panels of the Havel powerful powerless. You heard it in the testimony of Coco G of Burma who told us how important the message of Václav Havel was to him sitting there in his prison cell for so many years. You heard it in the testimony by video of Ioanni Sanchez from Cuba, who told us, you'll remember, she dreamed someday of finding Václav Havel's books in every Cuban library. You heard it in the testimony of people like Alexander Milankiewicz from Belarus, a country which barely qualifies even as an illiberal democracy. You heard it in the testimony by video of the Dalai Lama, and you heard it personally from the political head of the Tibetan movement, Lobsang Sangye. The value of Forum 2000 in this respect, I think, is very well captured in the language of the declaration which has been circulated and will, by the time we conclude, unquestionably be signed up to by the delegates attending this conference. The declaration, with its three themes that emerge from the, the page, the first one, that injustice and tyranny must be confronted with courage and perseverance. The theme that vibrant and engaged civil societies form the bedrock on which respect for human rights, functioning democracy, social justice and sustainable economic prosperity are based. And the theme, above all, of genuine and open dialogue being the key to responsive and effective decision-making. Above all, this dialogue across countries, across cultures, across disciplines is what Forum 
2000 is about. It's this kind of dialogue that this 16th Forum has delivered us in abundance and given every one of us attending here an enormous amount to think about. And it's this dialogue which I think we all hope, with the support, the continuing support of the donors, the Forum 2000 Foundation under the leadership of Thomas Ferber, and the very dedicated staff under the leadership of Jakob Klepal, of course, and of course, with the participation <coughs> of the extraordinarily distinguished participants who've attending this, been attending this forum from all over the world, we hope that with this support from all these sources, this is a dialogue which will long continue in the future. So let me conclude by asking you all to join with me in thanking most profoundly all those responsible for making this forum the success that it's been and wishing it a long and abundantly fruitful future for many more years yet to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gareth. And uh, our final speaker is going to address us via, via a video message. Uh, so please uh, listen now for a few words about friendship uh, by Her Excellency Aung San Suu Kyi. When I think of Forum 2000 and when I think of the Czech Republic, I cannot help but think of the being President Václav Havel. He was a man I regarded as a true friend, although I never met him, and only spoke to him once. But he kept me in his thoughts throughout the years when I was under house arrest, and when Burma was struggling for the opportunity to enjoy human rights and democratic standards. Human rights and democracy is a possibility now for our country. But we cannot claim to have achieved everything that President Harbour would have wished us to achieve yet. The struggle for human rights and democracy can be seen from very many different angles. But today I would like to talk about it from the angle of the friends that we gained through our struggle. There are no better friends than those with whom we share the same values. It is because the late President Dr. Fabel and we in Burma shared a hunger for democracy and human rights that we became friends across oceans and continents. I've always felt it a great loss that I never met him before he passed away. And yet, in a sense, I can say that he will never pass away from us. What is this friendship that is based on a common dedication to human rights and to democracy? It is a friendship based on a shared belief in the dignity of human beings, in the belief and confidence that human beings are capable of making a better world and making themselves better people. When I was under house arrest, friend wrote about me, and as an later, she quoted lines from a poem by Yeats. How many have loved you for your moments of glad grace, and loved your beauty with love both false and true, but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you, and the tears of the changing face. And actually left out the last line. Perhaps she thought it was not auspicious, but I've included it because I think the whole adds up to the most moving testament to friendship. To be loved for one's questing spirit is to be loved in the best possible way, and to be cherished throughout the years of your hardship as you struggle to live in truth is never to be alone. 
that was the kind of friend Pascal Havel was to us struggling away in Burma. He felt he made us feel that we were loved and cherished for our spirit of struggle, for our determination to build our society in a shape that would assure justice and security and peace and freedom for all our people. Forum 2000 will do everything it can to realize the dreams of Oscar Hubbard. In this, I believe, and this is why I am proud to be a new member of the Forum and to be able to take part in the present proceedings through this video message. Human rights and democracy add up to a subject that is unending, that will go on until our world comes to an end. Because as long as there are human beings, we shall have to keep fighting for our rights. It is in the nature of human beings to realize what our rights are, and yet often to lose track of what the rights of others are. Human rights, respect for human rights, means respect for others' rights, as well as the courage to stand up for our own rights. And democracy is a system that enables us best to protect our human rights. And that is why I believe very simply in the sanctity of human rights and democracy and in the friendship of people like Václav Havel, who stood up for human rights and democracy as long as they lived. I hope that all of you who are gathered here today will be inspired by his spirit and by his example his life to go forward in our quest to build a world which is rooted in respect for human rights and democratic institutions. Thank you.